Good evening and welcome to the Macedonia Cemetery webinar. My name is Tara Mesh. I'm a junior at Northview High School and a part of the SLJC class of 2022. This year, our group from Northview High School and Centennial High School have started working together to help restore the Macedonia Cemetery through fundraising and spreading awareness. We've created a website that can be found at www.macedoniacemetery.weebly.com and a GoFundMe page for donations. The Macedonia Cemetery contains a great amount of history that has sadly been forgotten over the years. While working on this project, I've discovered the importance of restoring the cemetery to a place of rest where we can honor those enslaved, their attendants, and others that are buried there. Today, we have many panelists from the Johns Creek Historical Society and the City of Johns Creek to share information about the cemetery and explain why they think restoring it matters. The other SLJC members moderating and helping with this event include Shrestha Jaw, Harrison Frank, Abhinav Chari, Carmela Dunn, Vidhi Tiwari, Megan Deering, Arian Afre, Summer Hickel, Anjali Dupam, Lauren Larson, Sophia Ying, and Harper Hughes. Before we begin with our panelists, we have a slideshow with a couple pictures and a little bit about the purpose of our project. Without the proper technology, there are many unmarked graves that the Johns Creek Historical Society is still working on finding. The picture on the left, top left shows some marked graves and probable grave sites from the 2017 report. Below that is a historical map from 1973 that shows the area of which the Macedonia Cemetery was located. By visiting the area and learning about the needs of the cemetery from the Johns Creek Historical Society, mm -hmm. our SLJC groups set up a GoFundMe page that can be found on our website in the chat box and at the end of this presentation to raise money for headstone repairs and other essential needs in order to create a memorial garden. With restored headstones, we're able to properly honor those buried at the cemetery and learn about their stories for years to come. With efforts to help the cemetery, others have raised money to create a sign, which is shown on the right, and we hope to continue to raise money and bring awareness to this large part of Johns, Creek, Johns Creek's history. These are a couple of pictures of the cemetery and some of the headstones. Here, you can see a couple headstones being fixed and the immense work it takes to ultimately get them standing out properly. The two headstones on the top left are the headstones of April Waters, a formal save, and R.L. Parson. These are a couple more pictures of broken headstones on the land and one standing out. The Student Leadership Johns Creek took the role of fundraising and raising awareness to ensure that we honor those buried here and help the Johns Creek Historical Society with their efforts. You can find further description of these efforts on our website along with the donation link. If you're interested in donating, you can also scan this QR code. And the donation link should also be in the chat box. So thank you all for joining us this evening to bring awareness to the Macedonia Cemetery. And we're grateful for any donations, no matter how small, to help restore the cemetery. To start off, we have panelists Joan Compton and Kurt Kennedy from the Johns Creek Historical Society. Hi, thank you, Tara. My name is Harrison Frank, and I'm a junior at Centennial High School. And I have a few questions for Ms. Compton. First off, could you start by telling us where the Macedonia Cemetery is located in Johns Creek, and then a general description of what it is? Sure. Um, so it's located in uh, on a two acre piece of land <clears throat> up a steep winding driveway uh, really quite near to one of the busiest intersections of Johns Creek the intersection of Menlock Bridge Road and Straight Bridge Road. Um, what it is the Macedonia Cemetery is a small historic African American cemetery here in our city. It has been abandoned for years as you could see from some of the pictures of the slideshow but um, in November the city did approve for acquisition of the cemetery and the associated properties. So we're really looking forward to um, moving the cemetery forward and its improvements. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I'm Tracia Cha, a junior at Northview High School, and I have questions for Mr. Kende. What is the role of Johns Creek Historical Society and how is student leadership at Johns Creek helping? Uh, yes, the, the role of um, the Historical Society is, is basically to bring forth and document the rich history of, uh, of Johns Creek, uh, going back to where it's a pretty much rural area, with single lane dirt roads, and, uh, encompassing in that is the cemetery. The role of the leadership, uh, junior leadership, John Creek, is to help us with our fundraising to uh, do uh, some headstone uh, restorations, as, as well as partnering with the uh, the city of John Creek to help us with some of the heavy lifting uh, as far as clearing up the land preparation for uh, uh, the ground penetrating rate. Thank you, Miss Compton. Could you also share with us the first and most recent burial at the Macedonia Cemetery? Um, yeah, so the oldest marked grave is Reuben Chandler, and that's from 1893. And the uh, most recent is in 1988, and that's uh, Masick Jones. Great, thank you. So, Mr. Candy. This, uh, what is the current condition of the cemetery? Well, the, the current condition of the cemetery is because it hasn't been uh, hasn't been made, uh, has witnessed uh, uh, growth of a lot of uh, uh, pine trees in the area where the headstones are, and uh, initially none of those trees were present uh, when this was an actively maintained cemetery. The overgrowth of, of sapling trees in the area with the old church. Uh, these these are things that had to be removed in order for us to uh, do a, a ground survey for find some of the uh, undocumented graves we suspect are there. I understand that some groups have gone to the site in the effort to help clean it up. How important is it in your mind that the site is stabilized and not disturbed as it is transforming into a memorial garden? Um, it's, it's, it's really important uh, that uh, care is taken and, and any kind of effort to uh, uh, clean the cemetery. Uh, there is a, quite a bit of uh, uh, pine straw and leaf debris that's laying on, on the bed of the cemetery and underneath that debris are probably broken headstones. So you have to be careful walking around in there. Uh, so it, take, it takes a, a, a bit of effort. Um, but I know some people have gone there with the idea that maybe they could clean headstones. Uh, and that's probably a, a dangerous thing to do because they want to go up with their bottle of Windex and scrub brushes and think they're going to clean the headstones. And, and basically what they do is just damage them even more. So there's a proper way to, uh, to clean headstones. Thank you. Going back to Ms. Compton, could you also speak a little bit about how the process of identifying mm -hmm. the buried at this site? Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, we know um, we've identified there are about 60 individuals that we've identified that are buried at the site, even though we, um, the survey done in 2016 by the archaeological firm uh, indicates that there are probably as many as 114 burials there. But we've identified 60 of them so far, which I think is great given the fact that there are really only about two dozen headstones um, marking the graves. So um, the question was, how are we identifying them? Was that it? Yeah, how are you figuring out who is there in their stories? Yeah, so um, so we started um, sorry <laughs> um, so we started with 
um, the surveys that had been done already. So there have been three of them of the, um, the markers, the headstones. And the earliest one was, that we have on record is 1997. So starting with those, that gives us a list of about two dozen people that we know are buried there because they're headstones with their names on them. Um, from there, I started looking at death certificates because death certificates say where the person who just died is going to be buried. So if I saw it was Warsaw Cemetery and they were listed as colored, um, I knew that that was the Macedonia Cemetery. Sometimes they identified it as the Macedonia Cemetery, but it's also referred to as the Warsaw Cemetery. So I used death certificates. Then I went and I looked at obituaries. The obituaries list not only the location of the service, uh, the funeral service, but also quite often the site of the burial, uh, as well as next of kin. So that also helped identify who was buried there. Great. And would you say that this cemetery consists, consists primarily of African American slaves or their descendants or a combination? Um, yeah. It, it's been identified, Macedonia Cemetery, unfortunately, has been identified um, as a slave cemetery. It's not really a slave cemetery. It's really a historic African-American cemetery where uh, some people who were enslaved are buried there, but not, not all, certainly, by any means. <clears throat> um, of the 60 that we've identified, Eight of those, I'm pretty sure, uh, probably 95% sure, were enslaved at one point in their lives. Two of them are fully documented, so there's no question whatsoever, but there are another six that we're pretty sure about. So in all, and again, you've only identified 60 out of maybe 114 burials, um, but we do know there are at least um, eight that were enslaved. Great, thank you. And thank you for taking the time to track down these people. It's very important. How many are buried at the cemetery? Oh, is that for me? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, I think we can document uh, probably 100, 115 uh, people or grave sites that are there. I suspect that there's probably a lot more uh, burial sites there because I believe that the earliest graves were north of where the church set that. And uh, we did find, uh, at one point, we did find a headstone north of the church, and that's outside of that fenced area. And one of the curious things is, is that, uh, uh, especially this time of year, uh, they plant daffodils around the graves. We could see where some of the daffodils come up in the spring. So we know that there are graves in that area. It hasn't been documented. And one of the things that the ground penetrating radar will do, we'll, we'll find those, uh, those extra graves. And there's, there's probably at least uh, another 100, 125 more graves there that we haven't looked at yet. A follow-up question. How many marked graves are there and how many do you suspect are unmarked? Uh, well, uh, I think it, as Joan indicated, I think we have about <clears throat> headstones that are there. Uh, I think we can we can document that there's about 24, 25 of those. Uh, there's some scattered <clears throat> there's some scattered headstones uh, laying on the ground where we don't know where they go uh, as far as uh, placement on the grave. But when you walk up through the graveyard, you can see the depressions in the ground where we know that there are great. So we're looking at numbers that we could look at right now, creating radar, probably in a bit of 150 graves. Thank you. Great. Ms. Compton, could you also share a bit about uh, some specific stories from these, the people that are buried here, perhaps April Waters? Um, yeah, so in particular, I mentioned that we think there are eight enslaved um, that we've identified that are buried there. April Waters is probably the most well-known. I give talks around town and I'm always talking about April Waters. Um, April Waters was also probably the first one identified, at least in writings I've seen. Um, and it was in 1997 uh, that there was first a story written about April Waters. So April Waters is known to have been a slave. There's no question about that. It's very well documented. Um, 
April was one of George Morgan Waters' slaves. Uh, he had, um, he was wealthy. He had a lot of land here in what's currently Johns Creek. And uh, he had at one time or another, a hundred slaves. Um, what makes April Waters interesting, well, probably a bad choice of words, but one of the reasons why we're studying April Waters uh, is not only that we know that April was a slave, but we also um, know more about uh, George Morgan Waters and his background. And um, I'm trying to think what I was trying to, going to say. Um, oh, I know. Okay, so there was a famous Supreme Court case here in, in, the, in Georgia that involved uh, not April Waters, but George Morgan. And it was thought that it involved April Waters to begin with. Uh, George Morgan in his will uh, was, did put in his will that he was going to free some of his slaves. Unfortunately, April was not one of them. Um, so April really was enslaved until the end of the Civil War. There are other um, slaves that I can tell you about uh, that maybe no one's um, done research on before. Uh, Reuben Chandler, who was born in 1848, so in 1865 when the Civil War ended, he would have been about 17. Uh, he was born in Georgia. His parents were born in Georgia. Um, there were Chandlers that lived in this area during the era of slavery, so it's a pretty good assumption that their family um, were enslaved. <clears throat> Um, and interestingly enough, Reuben Chandler actually did fairly well after the Civil War. He stayed here in Johns Creek. Not all of those buried in um, Macedonia Cemetery did stay in the Johns Creek area, but he actually rented a farm um, between State Bridge and Old Alabama Road, kind of actually where I live uh, in the Double Gate subdivision uh, with Johns Creek flowing through that area. And the other interesting thing about Reuben Chandler is that he rented his farm from another freedman. Uh, it's not someone that we think is buried at Macedonia Cemetery, but it is someone who worked here uh, as a slave, as Reuben did, um, in the Johns Creek area. And that was Robert Howell, and he actually owned 270 acres. So Reuben um, rented property from him. He tilled 65 acres. He had 20 acres of corn. He had cows. He had pigs. He had chickens. Uh, he owned his own mules. He owned his own farm tools too. So um, Ruben actually did fairly well. Great, thank you so much. Back to Mr. Candy. Um, I hear that there was a church that was located near the cemetery. Where is the church now? When was it established? What happened to the church building? If you could explain, thank you. Yeah, uh, some t a church was uh, established there somewhere in, uh, I believe, probably the mid 1800s. Um, unfortunately, the the church was vandalized, uh, and there's a was a central. I have one picture of the inside of the church, and it does show uh, the inside of the main support beam that held the roof, and uh, that beam was cut and allowing the roof to collapse on on the church and it had to be demolished. Uh, it, it basically fell victim to uh, vandalism. And as, as much as some of the headstones that were broken and scattered, they were also uh, victims of uh, vandalism. Uh, I didn't hear you, you had a follow-up question? Yes. A follow-up question is why did the cemetery, or the, why did the ch uh, church become abandoned? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. There were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of things happening uh, uh, with the church. You know, one, one of the uh, systemic things that happened with the people that lived there, uh, it was, it was hard, uh, hard to live there, especially during the era of Jim Crow. Freedom was not uh, quite free. The kids grew up, uh, they moved, and a lot of them went north for a better life and everything. They just kind of uh, left the old folks there, and as that folks aged and it kind of died out, a lot of people moved from the area because it was very difficult uh, 
especially for young people coming up, uh, very restrictive with the with the Jim Crow South. Thank you. Ms. Compton, could you also speak a little bit about if there were children buried at the cemetery that you know of, and if you have any of their any of their stories on hand? Um, I don't have any of their stories on hand. I just kind of wanted to follow up with something Kirk said. Um, it's kind of interesting what we're finding with the research of those who are buried there. Uh, they're actually really representative of, even though they're a small group that we know of, they're, they're very representative of um, a broader group of rural South African Americans. Uh, we've got those that were enslaved in the cemetery and then those that stayed here and worked as tenant farmers and in some cases on the same land where they were enslaved. And um, some of them stuck with farming all the way through the droughts and the boll weevil and the infestation and the Great Depression. But like Kirk said, others began moving uh, and were part of the big migration story to the north and to the cities uh, looking for a better life. As far as children, um, I don't really have the stories of the children. Uh, that's kind of a problem with African American um, cemeteries and trying to do the genealogy of African Americans. Uh, they're not as well recorded maybe as some of the white families. We do know well, of the 60 that uh, we've identified, six of them were young children between three months old and six years of age. And then two of them were teenagers. Both of those teenagers were 17. But um, at this point, I really don't have any stories about them other than, I guess, Helena Owsley. Uh, the Owsleys are all de descended from a slave uh, from Kentucky who was a wedding present to um, the wife of a man from here. And when they moved back here, Singleton Howell and his wife, uh, Agnes Owsley, and um, Robert Owsley, the slave, uh, came back here. So one of the descendants of that Robert Owsley was Helen Owsley, and she died at the age of five, but she also was um, what part of the story of the migration to the North. She actually died in Chicago. Her father, also called Robert Owsley, um, moved to Chicago trying to find a better job. Uh, Helen died, but the ties were still really strong here. So she, Helen was brought back here and, uh, and buried at the cemetery. Of the children you spoke of, do you know if any of them are tied to the other people that you found buried at the cemetery? Yeah. Um, yeah, they all are really. Yeah. Um, one of them, Sally Mae Parson, there are a number of Parsons buried at the cemetery. Uh, Mildred Parson was one of the 17 year olds. Uh, Carol Bice, there are other Bices buried there. Tucker, uh, I'm not sure if there's another Tucker there or not. She was um, three months old. Um, and one of the names actually we know uh, quite well in the, the Johns Creek area, uh, Summer R. Um, we haven't identified any other Summerars buried there, but Jeffy uh, Summerar, uh, age three, is buried there. Great, thank you again. Mr. Candy, what is the vision you have for the, ce for the cemetery? Oh, um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a growing aspiration, I think. Um, but the cemetery, <clears throat> Uh, should be made into a memorial garden. That vision encapsulates, you know, uh, the clearing of some of the, the tree uh, in the cemetery area, and uh, even uh, purchasing additional land that's uh, that runs north, or rather north uh, uh, east of the cemetery along Medlock Bridge Road, in order to. Uh, Make it into a memorial garden. Uh, you'll need obviously you'll need parking there. Uh, we'll need landscaping and everything. But you know we have to find where all of those unmarked graves are before you can start doing any planning for parking and, and uh, landscaping. Uh, and that's going to take partnership with the city. And the city is uh, very well aware of uh, what we're trying to do there. And uh, we're working very closely with the city to uh, to make that a reality, and hopefully in the in the near future. And it, and it's not a bridge too far because uh, we're not talking about a large sum of money. 
uh, to do what needs to be done there. Why do you think it matters to preserve the cemetery? Yeah, the reason it matters is, is probably because of a because of a moral conscious uh, that has to be explored. Uh, the, these people uh, lived in this area. They worked in this area. Um, they survived. Some of them survived slavery. Uh, they survived. Uh, the Jim Crow era, and uh, they were a part of this area's history for many years. And uh, one of the big issues is, is that uh, when we, we look at uh, how the cemetery and grounds were vandalized, the church was vandalized, uh, and uh, th th there's, a moral, there's a moral fiber that says, you know, we, these people deserve to rest in peace and they haven't been able to do that over the years. Uh, and as much as uh, months, a few months ago, there are still people using that cemetery as a dump. So this is kind of an ongoing uh, thing and, and uh, I'm very much aware of that. Uh, there are rules about desecration of cemeteries in, in Georgia with rather stiff penalties people are found in there and they're prosecuted. Um, Joan mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, she may have mentioned that the, the headstone of April Waters was removed from the cemetery and not only his uh, headstone was removed, but others were removed. And fortunately we were able to get uh, April Waters headstone back, but you know, that still falls under the umbrella of desecration. And even though uh, there may be some noble protective means why that happened, but yet and still, there's a matter of ownership of the property. Uh, and if you don't have uh, authorization from family members, then it's, it's unauthorized. So it's very important that this happens from a, from a moral conscious uh, standpoint for the city and for the residents. Thank you. Great, and to close us off, one more question for Mr. Kennedy. Can you speak a little bit about what people can do to help make these, this memorial garden a reality and to continue to restore the area? Uh, we know there's many ways to donate currently and is there anything else that people can do at this point? Um, I, I guess maybe the, the major thing is, is to raise, raise uh, the level of consciousness that this cemetery is there. there and it does need to be uh, restored and made into something that uh, John Street can be proud of, a Memorial Garden. Uh, so it, it's gonna require some funding. We're, we're right now partnering with the city of John's Creek to, uh, uh, to make that happen. There's some heavy lifting that has to be done uh, because the funding we're collecting now is, is not gonna uh, handle the large heavy lifting, especially if we're talking about additional land acquisitions. But the more funding that we can get, uh, the more we can, uh, uh, restore the headstones, uh, and we need to uh, fund the ground penetrating radar, and we need to uncover the ground and, and level out uh, uh, the ground where we have the depressions and everything. And then uh, for those unmarked graves, we need to uh, find a way to mark those. Uh, and I, I've had a conversation with um, uh, one of these companies that uh, uh, makes the granite countertops and everything, and they've agreed to uh, donate the little round, uh, sometimes square, uh, pieces of granite that are left over after they cut uh, countertops, uh, sinks. And we would use those to, uh, to initially mark those unmarked graves. They will be laying flat on the ground. And uh, the more uh, we can do that, then it can be easily maintained uh, because we don't have the upright structures. Great. Thank you so much. And that leads us into the funding and oh, land acquisitions. Oh. Go ahead, Jim. Say one word. Um, so Kirk spoke very well towards um, how people can help with improving the cemetery. Um, I just did want to say one word. Uh, there are a couple of people uh, in the area who have come forward, Charles Grogan and Chip Jones in particular. Um, who have ties to and knowledge of the African American community in this area. So one way that we can um, 
really find out who's buried there, I think, and find out what their lives were like, because records only go so far, is um, to ask the public if anyone has stories that have been passed on in their families, if they know where the records are for the church, that would be great. Um, or if they know of anyone else that's buried there that's not on our list, to please let us know. Thanks. Great, thank you for adding that. And you, one more thing, Mr. Kennedy? Oh yeah, and I just wanted to add to that also is that, uh, and uh, speaking with some of the uh, other gentlemen there, uh, Chip, uh, Chip Jones, he indicated that the, the person who built the church uh, was a gentleman by the name of Herman Osley. And a lot of his descendants are buried there, even though he isn't there. Uh, and he was kind of an entrepreneur in the area. And he uh, was reported to be the builder of the church. And when he was alive, he maintained the cemetery. So, you know, we're, we're uncovering these bits and pieces as we go along. Great. Thank you both so much for answering these questions and your continued support and work towards this goal of restoring the cemetery. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Once again, thank you. And thank you to Harrison and Shrestha. Next, we have a City of Johns Creek panelist, including the Mayor Pro Temp, Lenny Saprosky, Councilperson John Bear Bradbury, Councilperson Aaron Elwood, Councilperson Brian Weaver, and the President of Johns Creek Convention and Visitors Bureau, Linda Lee Smith. Was Aaron Elwood mentioned? Yes. Okay, maybe I missed that, sorry. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alvin Abchari. I'm a junior at Northview High School. And this first question is for Mayor Pro Tem Zabrowski. Could you tell us a little bit about the steps the city has already taken to acquire the, the cemetery property? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so right now the city is trying to get ownership of the cemetery. Um, I think if you look back at the records, I think it was first sold in like 1881 and then again in like 1905. And so in order to go up there and legally do anything, we need to take ownership. And we as a council have just decided to do that. Um, I believe back in 1998, before we were a city, uh, Fulton County actually went and did something called eminent domain. Um, the problem with this cemetery is trying to find owners that you could actually go purchase this from. So in 1998, I believe it was, Fulton County realized that they had a cemetery up there and wanted to clean it up. And so they didn't purchase the uh, property. What they did is they got an easement allowing them to go in there and they had to go in eminent domain that. So, they don't own it and we don't know, own it. So we have what's, we had to condemn the land. We have to first condemn it in order to get control, trying to give people an opportunity to say, hey, you know, here's where the money would go to and stuff. So we're in the process of doing that. Before we actually start that, we're working with Fulton County because they have the, the maintenance rights or maintenance easement. So they're going to give those rights to us. And then we're gonna to go to the state and uh, file a condemnation. So we're in the process of doing that. The problem with that is it's going to take a while because we don't know who the owners are. So this could take six to nine months, possibly. I actually talked to our city attorney today and he hopes to have it done by the end of the year. So that's why I guess from a city standpoint, we have to ask for a little bit of patience because we don't own the property and we can't go in there legally and do things. We have an easement or we can go through Fulton County to, to go and we have been maintaining it and helping clean it but we just need patience. And that's why this is a great time to plan for what we want this to be and what, what kind of place we want this to be. Um, and I will say, uh, just to note, um, you know, as far as cleanup and things, it's, I know everyone wants to help, but it's, it's really important to know, it, it, we have to be very careful about this because if you look at the way uh, graves and things were, were made back then in headstones, they couldn't afford headstones. So they had to use other materials, wood, plastic, sometimes it's, 
Mr. Canada said, uh, daffodils. And so you have to kind of look for, for things and those things get moved over time. So it's trying to identify where the, all the graves are is going to be a big deal. So that's why it's important that we kind of come together as a community right now, be a little patient until we can get ownership of it so we can actually have the right to do things um, and then go do it. I will mention one other thing that's important. This piece of property is landlocked, meaning we don't have access to drive to it. Um, we have an easement that allows us to go for maintenance, but that's going to be important if we want this to be something where people can come visit because we don't own the land to get up to it. We own just the land and it's owned by other people all around it. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Hello everyone, I'm Megan Deering and I'm a sophomore at Centennial High School and this is a question for Ms. Smith. Um, it says here that you're the president of the Johns Creek Convention and Visitors Bureau. How do you see the future of the Macedonia Memorial Garden as a visitor's destination to the people in Johns Creek? Thank you very much. So I'm actually not president, but I'm chairwoman, so I, I really appreciate being on the panel. Um, we've been following the Macedonia Cemetery Project for a couple years now. And the challenge is sort of for, for the Tourism Bureau, it really ties back to what Lenny just said, is ownership of the property. So um, the tourism, uh, the CVB, Johns Creek Convention and Visitors Bureau, is not an asset holder. We don't own property. We invest in uh, primarily city-owned property. So once the ownership is established, you know, I'm speaking for myself personally, but I have a vision, you know, after looking at all of the other similar cemeteries throughout Georgia, you know, I would love to see Macedonia become sort of a, a, a mini version of uh, Bonaventure in Savannah, you know, uh, not just uh, historic preservation, but, you know, uh, sculpture, reflection, uh, back to what Kirk said, as a memorial garden, a uh, place of reflection, and really looking at how we can build that up. The key for us as the CVB to invest in what we consider an asset, uh, Macedonia would be one of our assets for Johns Creek, is we do have to have a way for visitors to get to it, and it has to be safe, and it has to be maintained, and because of our um, wonderful advantage of being close to the Martin Luther King National Historical Site, we know almost a million people a year come to that site. And Johns Creek is part of the broader Metro Atlanta uh, tourism region. So we, you know, we see an opportunity for new funds, looking at this solely from economic development, um, to be brought into the community and really draw those individuals who are already coming to the Martin Luther King Historical Site. So this could be a true asset. I mean, obviously historical preservation, all of those components that Joan and Kirk have been talking about, but from a pure economic development perspective, we see it as another asset, a beautiful asset that could be developed out if we can make it accessible and make sure the, the ownership is, um, the, the clear title belongs to the city and all of that, then the CVB can actually invest in the landscape and the other elements to to actually turn it into the garden setting. Thank you so much. Uh, for this next question, I want to give all five of you a chance to respond. Uh, why do you all think it matters to make this abandoned cemetery into a memorial garden in Johns Creek? I'll. Uh... I'll jump in. Um, I think that Kirk Canada did a good job talking about this. And um, I think that as a community, I think, I think that we've seen from all corners of our community interest uh, and appreciation for the Macedonia Cemetery and its historical significance. But the bigger thing is, I think a modern society, our contemporary society, you and I and everyone listening, we really say something about ourselves by the way in which we honor and appreciate and respect the people that have gone before us. And so it's really an opportunity for us to um, highlight the fact that these were people that um, helped build this community at the early stages 
and that we are standing on their shoulders in many respects. And, uh, you know, I think that this can only be something that can help, you know, learn, learn from and, um, and just grow as a, a community and a country. Yeah, I'm happy to, do you want all of us to respond? Yeah, just briefly, if, if you can, anything. You Jump in, um, you know, be able to memorialize, um, to John's point, the people who came before us. I think that's really important. Um, John's Creek is known, um, well, it, it's not broadly known, but it is in fact um, a very internationally diverse city. We're known for that. We are in fact one of the most internationally diverse cities in the state and even one of the top in the country. And not all of our residents really know that. But um, I think just, just having the, the cemetery represent, um, you know, the beginning of where we started and where we are today. And, and really, I love the fact that, you know, Kirk and Joan and all of us really see this as a garden because I just, I think that, you know, a, a place of reflection um, on so many different levels, uh, it truly would, it truly is already an asset to Johns Creek. Now we just have to restore it and bring it back and, and really, um, transcend it into um, something bigger and, and so far beyond what it was ever intended to be. Yeah, I'd just like to chime in and say, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to serve on this uh, panel tonight. So, um, uh, this is another way, I think, to bring our community together. Uh, to show unity, to show that we uh, do embrace our diversity and that we can understand uh, what the American history is all about. I think a lot of times we miss a lot, but this will actually be a physical place where you can actually come to see uh, what American history is all about by having people who were enslaved and some who were not. But uh, it's a way for us to learn about our Johns Creek uh, history right here in the city. And I think it's awesome. I think it's an opportunity that uh, we've already embraced. So I know we're moving forward on it. And this is another opportunity for Johns Creek to show why we are special and why we are unique. And we embrace our different cultures and uh, embrace our diversity. I'll add one thing. Uh, first of all, apparently I said they used plastic at Headstone. They didn't use plastic back in those days. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> just wanted to see if y'all are listening, students. Um, no, I, I actually, I don't know what I envision it to be. That's why we have this great community. Um, you know, as a city council member, I want to first get ownership of it and let you know, our CBB and, and, and our historical society like Joan and Kirk, let them go do what they do because they're pretty amazing at finding facts out. And, it, and as a student, I didn't like history, but I, found my, I find myself listening to these two about a bunch of different things in Johns Creek, and they really do a good job, and I'm fascinated by it. Um, I love the idea of, of the history of this. Um, I think, I don't, um, don't quote me right because I did, obviously didn't do well, but they say if you, if you don't learn the past, then you're destined to repeat it. And we don't ever want to have that. But I think this is a great opportunity for teaching. We have a beautiful uh, veterans memorial here in Johns Creek. And I think this could be an added asset where people could come and just remember what we don't want to be again. Well, and finally, just to close it out, I mean, I agree with everything that the four of you said. You said it all very eloquently. Um, I would add only that the people buried there deserve it, right? They deserve to be remembered. And I think for those living in our city today, they, there's something to be said that we value those stories and we value those people buried there that came before us. And I think that's going to be meaningful to people in our community today, that we took the time to show that this is important to us as a city. Thank you all so much for that.
So this is another question for all of the city council members. Is the city committed to the site's preservation and restoration? And what steps do you see as, what do you, what steps do you as council members see to the coming months? I'll, I'll jump in if no one else wants to start. Um, so, you know, I will say that the Macedonia Cemetery for me and maybe for others, um, is really the only positive thing that I can think of that came out of the entire billboard fiasco. Um, the cemetery really became um, something that no one knew about, uh, or, or at least most people knew very little about. Um, Preserve Johns Creek uh, did commit funds to having an archeology span study done, um, and that was very enlightening. Uh, and we learned some history through that. I know that when I got elected, uh, to council, my very first official meeting with our city manager uh, at that time it was Warren Huntmacher, and uh, you know it was out of that meeting that we you know decided that we were going to have at least a fence, at least some kind of a structure that would be an impediment to people just walking straight up onto that property uh, to where the headstones were, uh, because to an earlier point, you know whether it was intentional vandalism or perhaps people just being careless uh certainly you don't want people just wandering up there um later we got a little bit of maintenance um uh, you know just very basic maintenance um you know and now we have started the process of trying to get ownership um i really do think that you know the future for the site is going to be something to memorial memorialize it and you know, what all the bells and whistles of that would entail, you know, that, that's for a group of citizens to decide. But I think that myself, and, and I can't speak for everybody else, but I think everyone is uh, really interested in seeing this become, you know, see its full potential. And, uh, and you guys and student leadership, John Sprig, are certainly helping us to uh, formulate that vision. So I thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump on something that John said about, you know, the bells and whistles that the citizens are going to provide us with. It's not a budgeted item yet in our, in our budget, um, providing for the Macedonia Cemetery. And we do the budget in the summer. And so I'm going to kind of turn it on you guys a little bit. What is the city, what do the people of the city want us to do? What do they want it to look like? And, um, you know, we need to hear from you as we go into that process in the summer so that we can make plans. Cause we don't own the property yet. So we can't actually start on it. But I think Lenny had said earlier that this is the time to be building those plans so that in the future we can actually implement them. So um, there's work to be done on that front. I'll just jump in to say that uh, it's really what we want it to be. I think the community has already uh, showed that it has embraced it and it will support it. Uh, thanks to Kurt who uh, and Joan who have been uh, there from the beginning, pushing us, uh, letting us know and uh, making us not forget that what we need to do as a city to make sure we preserve it uh, for our history and make sure we preserve it for the families and the people who are buried there. Uh, it's a unique opportunity. I think the city has spoken. I think uh, our council members support, support it. So I think with the Johns Creek community behind it, the way they have been, I think it's uh, will evolve into a very successful uh, memorial gardens or whatever Kurt and Joan and Linda and the rest of the uh, city council want it to be. Uh, I think it's a unique opportunity. I think uh, we'll do well and we'll, we'll be successful at it because it's something that we all uh, want to do and it's uh, near and dear to all of our hearts. I'll just add one thing. Uh, you know, we have spent, we did acquire, or we're trying to acquire that. So we did spend some money. I can't remember the exact amount around 50 to 60,000, I believe it was, I can't remember. So I think the council has been committed, but I'll just reiterate, this is the time that we should be using to plan for what this is because it's 
Council Member uh, Elwood said, we have we have no money in the budget for this right now. So if we can get a plan, then we can know how much this is going to cost. We can work with our partner organizations like the CBB and the Historical Society and, and whoever else could, wants to come on board. I think just this is such a critical time to plan and envision what this can be for our community. And I can tell you that the surrounding land is not going to be that inexpensive. So it's going to be a little bit of money to, in order to make this thing happen. So we just got to prepare. And I think with this community, I think this council showed that we're behind it, but I think the community is also showing they're behind it. And I think we'll come up with a plan together. I have something else to add, but I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance. And I think it's, Linda, do you have anything? Yeah, I was just going to add, um, you know, to Lenny's point, we, we, we would love to partner on this. It's really, it's really important that as we create the vision for the end, you know, the end result that we look at budgets and not, you know, not get overwhelmed by them. We can break them down over a period of years and we can do it in phases, um, which I'm a big proponent of. Um, we don't have to do it all to that tomorrow. So I think everyone needs to think big and all the appropriate individuals and the, and the citizens of the, commu you know, the community come together and really lay out that vision. There's still some unknowns, of course, with the acreage and if we have to purchase more property and so forth, but just getting sort of the core vision on paper um, so that we can start to look at what are the costs associated with each one of those um, phases. And that way the CVB can take on a component. It doesn't have to be all the city or, and there can still be fundraising going on. And so we all pull our resources together. It really helps a lot so that no one's bearing the full brunt of the cost. Yeah, Linda, you kind of touched on where I was going. The fact that just like with the Veterans Memorial, that didn't all happen overnight. You know, it started out with the core different elements were added over time. We just added the wall that heals just last year. Um, and so that's maybe how this could go as well, which is not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes you realize that there are things that you didn't think of earlier, right? Um, the other thing, as we're talking about kind of this being a, a part of a, a larger whole, at the last meeting that we had about a week and a half ago, one of the things that the council tasked the staff with was the idea that we would like to see some kind of at least preliminary or investigative numbers to flesh out what is the possibility of us having a pedestrian facility, a, a bridge or a tunnel across 141 that could allow people to get from, you know, the neighborhoods over to the Publix or from St. Ives and those neighborhoods over to the high school. But, you know, another part of that would be the Macedonia Cemetery and, you know, if there was a trail network through Johns Creek, certainly the ability to walk and visit this memorial site would be a significant feature. Thank you, all of you, for that. That was very insightful. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk about something. I think we touched on it. I think Mr. Bradbury touched on it a little bit. Mr. Kennedy also said it a little bit. Uh, do you guys know of any problems that people that you've had with people trespassing, whether mistakenly or purposely trespassing, and like what the reasons were and how you're dealing with it? I have just got to tell a small story, and people that know me know that I love stories. So when Preserve Johns Creek hired the uh, archaeologist, this would have been, I think, in December of oh gosh. It was in the winter time, I think it was 2016. And I was up there to see what the archeologists had been marking. They had put down different flags. And it was a typical December day, kind of like today where it was very overcast, maybe a little bit more stormy weather. And I had my back turned to the publics on the road and it was even much more wooded and uh, less kept up than it is today. And you know how you can just sense that someone is approaching. Well, someone was approaching from the street and it was a, a grown man, you know, a large man like myself. And he wasn't saying anything to me. And as he keeps walking and walking, not saying anything to me, 
I'm like, hey, what's going on? Where, you know, why are you here? Because there wasn't supposed to be anybody else there. And he's waving his phone at me and still not saying anything. It wound up that the man was there for Pokemon Go. Um, he was there looking for a Pokemon, a virtual Pokemon, uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, that, that was a little different. But there, you know, that site has been a place that people would do the geocaching, if you know what that is. Um, and, you know, before that, we saw evidence that people were going up there and, you know, drinking and who knows what else. At some point, we had a, a homeless person, unfortunately, you know, had made a, a little encampment there. Um, you know, that was one of the early things that, that got cleaned up. Um, I haven't heard stories of that recently, but it sounds like Kirk uh, had a story or some evidence of that more recently. But um, that's one of the things that I do worry about is that as we, you know, I think everyone's heart is in the right place. We want people to see this. We want people to appreciate it. But with that is going to bring more um, notoriety from people that maybe don't have as much respect for it. And so when we put up the fence, um, one of the things that, you know, there was this concern of, okay, how do we put up a fence that secures the site, but without making it so uh, rigid that people don't feel welcome to appreciate what this is really all about? And so as we look to the future, I think that we're going to have to figure out, you know, what exactly, how do we strike that balance between inviting, welcoming, educating, memorializing, but also preserving and protecting what's in the proper, you know, the cemetery proper. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add on to that or is, is that all? I'm not aware of any other incidents. I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, the city manager's office or perhaps the police department may be aware, but I'm not aware of any others. I think um, a lot of people now are interested in the cemetery and Kirk and I both get uh, emails about people that want to come and help, want to know more about it. So we'll definitely be sharing more information on our website, the Johns Creek Historical Society website. I saw some of the comments, questions about where people could find information. But I think maybe um, if we could encourage people not to go individually to visit it, uh, Kirk and I can maybe set up some times um, when we'll say we'll be there if somebody wants to come see it, um, come at that time. And, uh, and as we get to summer and nicer weather, we can definitely have maybe even a more formal program where we'll say on a Saturday morning, um, you know, if you wanna sign up to come, um, or an afternoon, uh, we'll tell you about the cemetery and point out various graves. And that way, maybe we can control uh, people coming on their own and walking in areas that might do some harm. And I, I would just add, you know, having, um, you know, the CVB invested heavily in the, the tunnel up near McGinnis Ferry. And um, you know, we occasionally, the city maintains that now, but we occasionally have vandalism in that beautiful piece of art. Um, and I think we, we do probably on some of our other assets within the city. So that's, you know, even after this materializes into the ultimate vision, I think having, you know, obviously the lighting, all the things that come with us creating whatever that, that end vision looks like, the lighting, so forth really helps to deter some of that. Mm -hmm. It still happens occasionally, but I think, um, you know, even with the uh, veterans wall, you know, we had an incident right after it was installed. Some of it is accidental and some of it is intentional, but, you know, looking into uh, having, you know, a video camera or something, you know, again, just um, really, really limits the number of people who are willing to cross the line, um, you know, once you finish it. But right now it's vulnerable. Hmm. It is, and the city's aware of it. We just don't have ownership yet. So I know that I think uh, we've committed to some signs and things, but um, I, I know that's on the radar, I'll just say. Thank you Dr. so much. So we have a quick question from our audience. Um, 
where can we find the list or name buried there to ask within our circles for family in the area? So I actually have a lot posted at the Johns Creek Historical Society website. Um, it's www.johnscreekhistory.org. A lot of it's in a hidden area that's used by researchers. What I'll do is I'll start pulling some of that out and putting it on the accessible area. Uh, one of the things can be a list of who's buried there. Um, and then uh, definitely contact us if you know of anyone. Um, again, the greatest thing would be if somebody steps forward and says, you know, we've got the records from the church and the cemetery. But even if we never get that, uh, just having people who um, uh, might know somebody who was buried there or had heard stories passed down through their family um, will be a great help for us doing our research. Thank you so much. And thank you for all our, uh, thank you to all our panelists and thank you for joining us this evening. For more information, visit www.macedoniacemetery.weebly.com where we have more information on the Macedonia Cemetery as well as articles on the area, pictures, and the link to donate. You can also find the donation link in the chat. Hope you all have a wonderful evening and thanks again for helping us bring awareness to the Macedonia Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we're just going to take a quick picture of all of our panelists real quick. Hopefully we didn't lose anyone. Um, yeah. So Is Linda still on? Feel free to turn on your cameras and we will take a screenshot. Okay. Thank you for hosting everybody. And, uh, thank you for hosting and be sure to thank Miss Sanders because she likes to hide in the background. Thank you, Miss Sanders, for doing this. And thank you, Mr. Canada. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Irene, student leadership. Right. I am I didn't get to take the picture. So three, two, one. Okay. Um Thank you. Yeah, sorry, you can continue. Oh, Didn't mean to cut you off. Thank you again. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email um, at uh, me and I can pass it along to any of the panelists. Um, my email, I'm putting it in the chat right now. And um, if you have any questions at all, I, I'll be happy to um, pass it on to any of the panelists. So thank you again for coming. Enjoy your evening. Thank Go you. Chief. I had to say it. <laughs>